our damn hair alone for crying out loud. Yeah. Is this really too much to ask? Mijn naam is Rosie en ik ben Rost. Dit is de Rostistische podcast. Wayho, welcome to a new episode of the Rostistische podcast. Today, as you hear, we're talking in English because I have an amazing guest all the way from London. None other than Jackie Collis Harvey. Jackie is the writer of the book Redhead, a natural uh, Red, a natural history of the redhead. I just finished the book. I have it right here with me with a beautiful painting um, of a redhead on the cover. Um, and yeah, Jackie is here with us today to talk all about it, to go through the history of the redhead and how the societal view on redheads, gingers, whatever you want to call it, has evolved throughout time. Welcome, Jackie. How are you? Very nice you? to be here. Hello. How lovely to meet you. Likewise, I've, I'm impressed by my own introduction. Um, it, has, it has gone well. So, and I very much appreciate the um, top you're wearing. Wonderful right. shade of red. It's color coordinated. I was, and I also have this red vase in the back, as you can see. Oh, yes, 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 yes. She's pink and she's red. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is something redheads always imagine they can't do, that they can't actually wear red or pink. And yes, we can, people. Yes, and we can. We should. Literally. So your book, your baby, it must, <laughs> as, you, as you're a beautiful redhead yourself, it must be very special to you to have written such a book. It was a very, very fascinating experience because apart from anything else, it got me to my first Redhead Festival. I learned a lot about myself while I was writing this book, as well as the world of Redheads. And the I redhead have to days. say, yeah, you know, it. it yeah. I mean, we've just had the Redhead Festival in Tilburg last weekend. Yeah, I, I was there. And you had a good time, I yeah, hope. Yeah, yeah, it was, it was amazing. I, I didn't have any expectations, but it was, yeah, it, it was so good. I really felt um, safe and yes. appreciated yes. And, uh, and a majority <laughs> for once. <laughs> I know, I know. It is the strangest feeling. I remember uh -huh. when I walked out of my hotel, when I first went to the festival, And the street was full of redheads. It's just extraordinary. You're so used to, you know, there might be you and one other redhead in the carriage on an un on a subway yeah, train. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Or, um, you know, you, you might pass another redhead walking in the street. But you get used to being you know, visually solitary. And then mm -hmm, suddenly mm -hmm. there were your people. Mm -hmm. Quite extraordinary. Was, yes, it was even a bit overwhelming. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, it can be. It's a yeah. it's a very different experience from being, you know, sort of the only only redhead in the room to being in a room full of redheads. It makes you feel quite differently about yourself. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And you finished the book beautifully with your experience in in 2014. I guess. Yeah, well, yes. you know, you I couldn't not really. I mean, it was it was the perfect high point to end the book on for me. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I interrupted you with my um thoughts about the festival but you were saying how much the book meant to you oh yes it yeah it, well it was um it was my first foray into non-fiction and obviously it's a subject that was very close to my heart and I found it absolutely fascinating the further I went into the story of red hair and redheads and the more connections I could see I was building up between scientific fact and cultural happening and um, societal reactions, the more I began to understand myself. And I've heard this from an enormous number of my readers. People have come back to me and said that there are aspects of their life ha as redheads um, or things that have happened to them because of their red hair that now make sense to them in ways that didn't at all. So that's been very satisfying. Yep. The way you impacted your community. Yeah. In a good way. Exactly. Every yeah. writer wants that. Yeah, yeah, of course. And the the word natural, what what does that mean in the title then? Well, there's a there is a little story to go with that. I got the idea for the book when I was sitting in. I used to work in publishing before I became a full time writer, and I was sitting in a sales conference watching another publisher present their series of natural history titles, and they had you know natural history of the cat, natural history of breakfast. Okay. 
natural history of the I don't know the the internal combustion engine, and it was a um, a very uh, a useful way to approach all of these different subjects because you knew pretty much exactly what you were going to get. You know, there was going to be a sort of breakdown of the mechanics of it, and then the the philosophy and the the cultural references. And I just this idea of just a natural history of the redhead popped into my head, mm-hmm. and my um, English publisher, the publisher of the edition that you have, they very much liked the idea of that. But the new, yeah, 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 Alan yeah. and Unwin, yes, yes, and they were they were very interested in this idea, and I, I, it may be that it's an idea which is. Um, more commonly used in conversation over here in England than it is in the States, for example, because my American publisher, the original publisher for the book, said, no, 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 this isn't just a natural history. This is a a philosophical and a cultural and an artistic and a literary history. So we will just call it History of the Redhead. So it's the same book, but it has these two different titles. So let's let's start with the history of the Redhead first. Sure. Um, Yeah, you talk about it elaborately in the book which is what I also wanted to say I really like the way you write because it's it's very um evidence based it's like a sort of um a, a yeah. summary of yeah. what you've read your your research but you also bring your personality in it and your your own um like sometimes cynical um reaction to to it so I really appreciated that Well, I'm I'm very glad to hear that you enjoyed it. It was one of the things I set out to do when I began writing the book. I thought I'm not going to repeat all the same old nonsense you just get that sort of swaps from one website to another because there are an enormous yeah. number of websites out there devoted to redheads. Yes, yes, yes. And you don't know what's real and what's not. No, exactly. So I, you know, I thought I'm going to research this right down to the ground, and if I can't find um proper scientific thinking or historical evidence to back these assertions up then i'm going to say so uh-huh. Uh-huh. and then we're going to be talking about redheads and witchcraft later on and that was i spent weeks trying to bottom that subject out chasing one reference after another through the british library it becomes an obsession well it was an obsession yeah. when i was writing the book it was a complete obsession i you know yeah. i wanted to get this yeah. right let's let's first focus on where we come from the 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 gene the the gene that yeah. colors our hair red and and has a lot of other characteristics to it um, where does it originate from well where it originates from is a mystery where is um uh one of those little bits of genetic happenstance but we do know pretty accurately when which was something between 40 and 35,000 years ago at the point when the um the early humans who then went on to become you know so you and me and all of us had left africa and were in the grasslands of central asia that seems to be where the gene when the gene originated quite why who knows who knows mm-hmm. it just did you know sort of where did genes come from maybe coincidence yeah you know sort of something some you know, some some little bit of um human chemistry or something or another it's it's like um trying to work out where the gene for blue eyes came from you know why did that happen i mean when we were originally we all had beautiful brown or hazel eyes like you yep. and yep. dark skin you know not like not like redheads at all but this gene originated somewhere between 40 and 35,000 years ago The early human population was at that point in the grasslands of Central Asia. Okay. My private theory, and I have no scientific evidence for this whatsoever, okay. is that some of those people went left to the Black Sea and then up into Europe following the river valleys, and some went right and became part of the population of what is now um Western China. Um, and the province of Xinjiang, um, where there seems to be archaeological evidence of there having been redheads amongst the general population many, many, many thousands of years ago. Mm. So that's a really native, native redheads population. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And we stayed in Europe as there was less sunlight in, up in the north. And well, 
we did um this is one of the ways in which the human race is very much at the mercy of its genetics rather than it being the other way around by complete coincidence <laughs> the gene for red hair goes along with having pale skin and if you have pale skin you're much much better at synthesizing um vitamin d out of whatever is available in the way of sunlight now obviously pale skin when we were all still in Africa and pale skin on the steppes of Central Asia, not going to be an advantage at all. But when you get up into these, you know, grey northern European climes, then pale skin that enables you to make as much vitamin D as possible from whatever sunlight is available is a very, very good thing. And this is one of the um, points where the genetics of being a redhead and the cultural associations of being a redhead intersect in a way that I find absolutely fascinating. Because if you were a girly like you and I, and your mm -hmm. system had a lot of vitamin D in it, then you grew up with a nice strong skeleton and above all, a nice strong pelvis, which meant that you could carry children in pregnancy and give birth to them safely because you didn't suffer from this ghastly disease called rickets which yes, is a, yeah. you know, sort of one of the consequences of not having enough vitamin d in your diet so we were kind of um like a beauty um uh, ideal for procreation I suspect that may have had something to do with it. I think there, you, there may have been a realization way, way, way back when that if you chose a redhead as a mate, a redheaded woman as a mate, then it increased your chances of having children and of passing your own genes on. And it was unfortunately nothing to do with the red hair at all. Mm -hmm. It was all because of the benefits under grey northern skies of having pale skin. Yeah, I've spoken about this with um, a, uh, a researcher, a man who's done a, a lot of work on um, redheads and particularly on pale skin and he sent me um, a photograph of uh, the skeleton the pelvis of a woman who had had rickets and you would have thought someone had taken her pelvis and they tried to turn it in turn it into a knot basically it was dreadful I mean I don't understand how she could have walked and she absolutely there's no way that she would have been able to give birth to a child mm -hmm. and it was a very very prevalent disease mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. you know even in the 19th mm -hmm. century people were still suffering from rickets so if you had a characteristic yeah. that meant you didn't have to worry about that it would have been a significant advantage yeah and also I think I, I read that it's it's a beauty standard as well in in now in Ireland and more up north. So that's why there is also a higher representation um, and a higher percentage of, of redheads more in the northern of Europe because people just like it more. <laughs> I think there is something in that, but I think it's more that populations which are liminal, which are on the, the sort of the, the edge of the... Um, of geographical areas where yeah, there yeah, is yeah. less ebb and flow fewer people come to them fewer people leave from them yeah it's an island as well exactly that kind of circumstance is going to give a recessive gene the greatest possible chance of expressing itself because it doesn't get masked by all of this other genetic material coming into the community That, I think, is the reason why you find so many redheads in Ireland and Scotland compared to, um, say, well, I don't know, well, to England, for example, or in um, Scandinavia, too. It's a phenomenon known as genetic drift. And you can work okay. out the mathematics of it quite easily as a as a general rule. Uh, even though it's been estimated that 40% of the population of the United Kingdom carry one copy of the gene for red hair, in Ireland or Scotland, the expression of that gene, the number of redheads, runs at about, I think, so 10, 11%, whereas yep. in the population globally, the number of redheads is about 2%. So, you know, on yeah, average, we're crazy. still pretty unusual. We just in these in these areas where the population is left undisturbed for longer, there are more of us. I have a story about my friend who did an exchange there, and she she's in a family of redheads. She has dark hair herself, but um, her friends 
were doing ginger counts. Oh yeah, in um, in Ireland and in Scotland. But it was it was a bit weird because they were posting as well, like wow, ginger count forty. Um, so at, as if we were like some sort of circus animals or. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. It can tip over into something else very, very easily. Freak, Weirdly freak enough, show. even even though red hair, yes, it is celebrated in Ireland and Scotland and redheads there are quite justifiably proud of themselves. It's the places where red hair is rarest that um, where, you know, when I first went to Italy, people were literally turning around in the street because red hair is so unusual there. And it was it was really really celebrated as being something special and um i you know none of the things that were shouted after me were insults by any means at all mm-hmm. so you know, this is it says something about human nature how we um the problems in our responses to difference you know, it can be celebrated yes, yes, or yes. it can be regarded as something very very suspicious as well yeah it's it's i don't think it will ever disappear it's oh no it's, no 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 everything that's different yeah is is singled out and is it out of insecurity of of the person that does it or i think it's it's out a of mix boredom? of insecurity of threat as something different is perceived as a threat um not like us you know uh-huh. got the entire history of racism in those three words haven't you uh-huh. um but then I think there's also this this curiosity factor where we are hardwired to respond to things that are different. We want to find out about them. Very often we want to touch them. There is a very interesting piece of research which suggests that when, again, many thousands of years ago, when we were first evolving color vision, Red was one of the first colours that we learned to recognise because it enabled us to tell ripe fruit from unripe. So we Mm -hmm. really are hardwired going back tens of thousands of years to respond to the colour red, even without all of its associations with blood and with the returning sun and with fire, with all of these really, really primeval forces and um, mm. essential aspects of la- of our human lives it you know red is, is is fundamentally important to all of us yeah yeah it's it's an it's primal yeah as you exactly said. yeah that's yeah. the very word yeah but i think it's i don't people are not born with the urge of touching red hair i think because um i talked to an eight-year-old in one of the episodes and she was she was um, talking about her experience at school and, and she said that she was fine, that there was no bullying, that people didn't really um, see it as something different or uh, they, they complimented her um, instead of bullying her. And then she said that adults on the street did come to her and touched her hair or asked her mom um, about it. So yeah so. yeah yeah I think this is a generational thing I'm very cheered at the fact mm-hmm. that children are so much smarter about this the business of prejudice and bullying and discrimination than even the, the generation as close to them as their own parents ever was uh-huh. when when I was growing up there was a you know there was a great deal of bullying of redheads I yeah. was lucky in that I didn't I didn't suffer from it myself, but I certainly know many, many redheads of my age who did. Um, and even I grew up in Suffolk in the east of England, as did Ed Sheeran. And, um, okay. I, you know, he's spoken about he I went to a little village school. He went to a little village school. He's spoken about his experiences as a child. And it has taken a heck of a long time for this to change. It's really only in the last... 20 years or so that I think there has yeah. been this this change in attitudes and this understanding and this reinforcing of the fact that this sort of behavior is just not acceptable and you simply do not do it. And have you have you met um, Ed Sheeran? No, I haven't. I absolutely okay. love to. I re- I really would, but he's he's yeah. done so much for redheads. He really has, and he's done it without yeah. being 
overtly red-headed about it at all. I mean, it's his wonderful skills as a musician that have have brought redheads, well, brought him to the fore. But he says himself that when he was on YouTube, people knew him because they say it's the bloke who plays the guitar with red hair. And there was only one of them. So there we are. Mm. It's so easy to make it, yeah, to stand out and also to make it your, your brand or add to your brand. I'm also going to use it. I'm using it right now. <laughs> mm. And you should. Absolutely. Why not? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you're using it even when you arrange to meet someone and they say, you know, what do you look like? And you say, well, I'm a redhead. That's using it as your brand as well. Yeah. I, I've i gone back and forth on this, but I'm as well as I also write fiction as well as nonfiction. And I'm writing a book at the moment which has a redheaded heroine in it because, you know, this old thing about write about what you know. But mm-hmm. um, I, but when I finally decided that I was going to make her a redhead, I was amazed at the number of opportunities this gave me to, you know, to to enlarge what I was writing about, really, to explore different um, aspects of being different to other people yeah. through the fact that this woman has got red hair. Yeah. It, it does fit with the um, prejudice about redheads that they're adventurous and uh, fearless um, yeah. that you that you make her the, the heroine. Um, but could you talk about where these prejudices come from and what these prejudices are between between men and women as, oh, as redheads? Oh, that's really interesting. That was one of the things that really drew me to this as a subject for a book because it's so unusual where you get these stereotyped reactions for the woman to come out with a, the better deal, if you can call being you know, sort of so overtly yeah. and highly yeah, sexualized yeah, yeah. throughout history, having a better deal. Yeah, it's fascinating. It really is. Because the, the stereotype of the redheaded man is that he's he's either um, utterly berserk in, you know, sort of the Viking sense of the word, um, mm-hmm. and is a complete hooligan and a total savage, or um, he's a you know, he's wimpish in some way. Um, you know, he you know he's not nothing like as manly as he would be if his hair was a different color, and you know it's just absolutely ridiculous. Whereas a for bit of red a clown. Head- Yes, exactly. Well, that's a very interesting thing because that is one of the um, one of the the roots I trace this stereotype back to. I spoke about earlier about the um, the people who went left from Central Asia and ended up around the air, in the area of the Black Sea and then up into Europe through the river valleys. There is um, uh, historical evidence of encounters between the ancient Greeks and Romans and people living around the Black Sea who did have red hair, the Thracians. And they are they were noted at the time for having red hair. They're described as redheaded and blue eyed. And the Thracians had a very bohemian society, as we would call it now. Um, The women in particular were not restricted at all in terms of their choice of sexual partners. They could have as many as they wished. Who cared? Okay. Which is most unusual. And Uh this resulted in the birth of a lot of children who were basically not wanted. And these poor little kids were sold into slavery. And many of them ended up as slaves in Greek and Roman households. If you uh-huh. look at Greek theatre in particular, you will find that the clown characters who are hooliganish and brutish are nearly always depicted as having red hair. And then the names of these characters in, in Greek comedies suggest that they were named for their hair as well. They have names like, uh, you know, sort of Goldie, for example, or uh-huh. Fiery. And... It's it's a uh, uh, I mean quite obviously the Greeks and Romans did regard these tribes around the Black Sea as being horrendously uncivilized, barbarian, barbarians. Yeah, the essence of yeah. barbarians. So that you know you maybe you can trace that prejudice right back to the you know the presence of these um, Thracian slaves in Greek and Roman households, and then the um, the cultural referencing of them in Greek comedy. 
you do, of course, get redheaded clowns in the circus. I think that's a you know sort of a cultural memory of M- these. McDonald's exactly, yeah. and then you've got blasted Ronald McDonald, who I have to say I absolutely loathe. I'm one of these people who find these clowns deeply creepy. In any yeah, case, yeah, yeah. or it's. It's yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I could never watch that movie. Uh-huh. Never watch that movie. I'm <laughs> fine with other horror movies, but that one, no, no, no. That just presses way too many buttons. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so you know, and you, 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 so you've still got this redheaded clown thing. Uh-huh. Um, you've also uh, talking about the women. Of course, we've spoken about the associations between redheads and fertility, and you know, bearing children successfully, but. Um, whereas redhead for a man, uh, red hair and the pale skin for a man means that you, you you're sort of wimpy and you don't you know earn your living in your in the fields or on the battlefield with your fellow men. For women, pale hair speaks of seclusion and the harem and being kept separate from society as something special and exotic and sexy mm-hmm. and um, as a bit of a prize, really. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if you can. Um, if you can wrap your head around the idea that um, having an image which is based upon nothing but your sex appeal is a good thing, then being a redhead is a much easier thing to be as a woman than it is yeah. as a man. But a lot of women uh, are like it, um, oh, I, yeah. I, I realized, because I was asking, I was interviewing redheads at the festival last Sunday, and I asked, what's the best thing about redheads, uh, about being a redhead um for you and she was like yeah because yeah they think um we're fiery and you know yes. we're we're attractive and we're we're yes. good in bed and yes yes and, yes and, we're and I, fiery and passionate and uh-huh. sensual and adventurous and and then i asked her so that stereotype is then is it's it's right for you and she was like yeah yeah it's it it makes sense and i was like okay <laughs> but I talked to a gene specialist and she told me that it's nurture and not nature. But yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, if if there's an if an uh, if the assumption is that you're going to be confident in bed, let us say, then you're probably going to be confident. In yeah, bed. true. It's a, it's a confirmation bias. Yeah, exactly. It's that's yeah. that's that's that yeah, it's a very very interesting example. However, I have been told, I wouldn't know this myself, but I have been told and this is a pale skin again, that the mm-hmm. flush of orgasm on a redhead is very noticeable and extremely gratifying. So, mm-hmm. it might mm-hmm. have something to do with that as well. Yeah, this is I something that. I think us redheaded women will have to explore, you know, we'll yeah. ask our partners whether this is so. Yeah. yeah, whether this is true. Maybe they hate it. <laughs> yeah, who knows? You know, we might uncover something yeah. here. Yeah. So let's take a small break uh, for now. And then in the second part, we will go um, deeper into redheads in art because we were an inspiration for many, many, many painters in the past. You know, leave our damn hair alone for crying out loud. Is this really too much to ask? For goodness sake, it was always happening to me when I was a child. When I was little, my hair was down to my waist. And it was as if it didn't belong to me at all. It was as if I had some kind of... um, other creature sitting on top of my head who is public property yeah. and everybody wanted to yeah. come along and pat it and comment on it and talk about it. Yeah. Now that's going to make your, anybody fed up, you know, whether they've hair, got red hair or not. Mm, true. Your your hair was, was not yours. It was kind of a public... No, belonged good. to everybody yeah. else. Yeah, yeah. Before we get into the uh, art history of redheads, how come that so many gingers, I mean many... Um, not really, but um, that there is redheads in all, nearly all ethnicities. How is that possible? Well, it's just because the gene is shared around. You know, it's a recessive mm-hmm. gene, so it stays hidden. Then if you bring two people together who are both carrying the gene, there is a, a chance that their, ch- their child will inherit two copies of the gene. If you are a redhead, you have only got those two copies of the gene. I mean, you, that that's the only genetic um, information that you're going to be able to pass on to your children, for example, if when you have them. Um, uh-huh. And I think it's I think it may also have something to do with the fact that there is this um, the business of um, 
Ireland and Scotland, the people who lived there, that you know, they were part of a human diaspora themselves, going over to America, going over to Australia. We all came from such a small group of you know, original survivors of the population that came out of Africa. I was reading in the paper only yesterday that there was, um, scientists now think that there was a genetic bottleneck where uh, the human race was almost wiped out. It was down to about um, 1,300 people, I think, on the whole of the planet many, many thousands of years ago. So that genetic material was very concentrated, but it, you know, it found a way through. Um, and it would have been shared around everybody. So perhaps right from the beginning, the redheaded gene was there, just you know, sort of waiting to express itself and for favorable circumstances in which to thrive. Yeah. And we do. <laughs> yeah, we do. We do. There is also this completely different genetic break, which means that there is a, an island in Polynesia where the people have very, very, very dark skin, obviously, because they're living practically on the equator. But they also have red hair. And it's a totally independent genetic cause for it from anything in northern Europe or anywhere else in the world. That's crazy. And they don't have the uh, sensitive skin. No, they don't. Their skin is, is, is very, very dark. They look astonishing, you know, really, really striking. But of course, they need the dark skin to survive under the sun as fierce as that. Yeah, you have an example in the book, right, of the, yeah. the picture? Sort of typically, it was thought for ages that it was um, an inheritance from European sailors who had entered, who had um, stopped off at the island. Sense of superiority and we must be responsible for everything kind of thing. Uh, But uh, no, it's not. It's a, it's a spontaneous genetic break that happened all on its own. Quite fascinating. Um, and it does make you wonder about the... Um, The number of times in which perhaps red hair um, appeared spontaneously in the population, if you could do it once, you know, all those thousands of years ago on the grasslands of Central Asia, or then again in Polynesia, perhaps mm -hmm. there are other versions of redheads that just haven't been genetically bottomed out yet. Yeah, for sure. It's super, super interesting. You were comparing in your book, um, or you were using the word racism, um for discrimination towards gingers there is discrimination or there used to be i hope there is much much less of it now but there certainly used to be discrimination towards redheads just as there is discrimination towards anybody who is a bit different from the the population as a norm um uh -huh. it, i mean we're not a race for goodness sake so you know you uh -huh. can't call it racism um and you although it has been caught up in the kind of prejudice ex that has historically been expressed towards the Jewish population, for example, because you do get quite a lot of redheads amongst the Jewish population. It's not it's not racism in the same way as, you know, somebody who who is Jewish or somebody who is black would understand it, for goodness yeah. sake, or somebody who and is Asian. It's not like that. It's kind of it's it's under the radar in one. In some ways, uh -huh. this makes it more, even more pernicious because it's. Um, it used to be that if you made a fuss about the fact that someone was discriminating against you as a redhead, they would just come back and say, well, you know, so what are you making such a fuss about? You know, this is this is nothing really. This is just, you know, sort of jolly, jolly fun, you know, like a joke. Um, uh -huh. But, it, you know, the, all these these attitudes are all connected. I've I've. Um, The um, comparison I use a lot is that it's like bindweed. You know, you've got to root it out wherever you find it, because if you leave one little bit in there, then it's going to start growing again. So you've got discrimination at one end of the scale and the most appalling instances of racism at the other. But there is a connection. It's a continuum. There's a line between them. You use the word racism for what reason then? Well, uh, I don't towards, say that discrimination uh, against redheads is racism, but mm -hmm. um, I, you know, I make the argument in the book that there is this connection between these attitudes, mm -hmm. these casual attitudes towards difference. And when the book first came out, um, you know, there was a, you know, there's a lot of debate and discussion about this. And I, you know, obviously, some of the people who interviewed me thought I was making a big fuss about nothing. That uh -huh. has changed, and uh -huh. people do. I think generally people are much more aware and educated and informed now about how discrimination 
and racism work and how there is this connection between them. Gingerism is, you know, as I said in the book, it's an ugly word for an ugly thing. It's not that it's not yeah. the same as racism, but there is a connection. Yeah, because yeah. to be to be honest, I am a bit scared or worried that with my my project, my podcast, that people will um, be mad because I make another problem in the world. There is already so much suffering and so much um, inequality and so much drama and pain. Mm -hmm. And I I decide to make the story about me, you know, but it's not about, it's not about, I don't claim my pain to be worse than, than other people's pain. No. It's, it's just that society has been telling our truth um, and that it's time to claim it ourselves now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, and for the people that want to hear it, if you don't want to hear it. Yeah, then. yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. And, I, you know, as I said, I was lucky as a child. I wasn't bullied. My parents brought me up to think of my red hair as being something special and being different as being a good thing. But some of the redheads I met at the um, redhead days in Breda, when the festival was held there, they had the most appalling stories of bullying. I, you know, sort of violence mm -hmm. meted out upon them for no reason whatsoever, other than the fact that their hair was a different colour. It's shocking. Uh, you know, and it really, really, really has to stop. Yeah. Stop. Rossism. Yeah. Yeah. Stop <laughs> that, bullying. Yeah. Stop discrimination. Yeah. Start celebrating difference as something that's good. You know, it's, it's yeah. one of the most wonderful things about being human is the fact that we come in all of these different shapes and sizes for crying out loud, you know? 100%. And the, the, you, you said that ginger is an ugly word, mm. right? Where, where does it come from and why are there so many different names for red hair? And it's not even a red. It's yeah, like, I know. <laughs> it's not orange. It's not red. It's yeah. It is what yeah. it is. Well, I say gingerism is an ugly word, but um, ginger itself—it's a very, very interesting question. I mean, the um, the I, I there is this association with. Um, you know, ginger is it's hot in the mouth I think there's a connection there but and the idea of the taste of the spice and redheaded being or supposed to be being fiery and hot tempered as uh. far as I can tell the first use of the word seems to have something to do with cockfighting there was a um, okay. uh, what it was an it was a name a ginger was a name given to one form of cockerel Cockfighting, I mean, that's a horrible thing in its own right, for goodness sake, you know. Yep. <laughs> so let's not perpetrate the word ginger for redheads in any case because of that. There's the Tim Minchin song as well, which is very, very clever, the way that it plays around with the word and um, uh, you know, it pokes fun at discrimination and um, differentiation and racism of all types, both, you know, the most serious and um the the least um you know i've 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 rarely been called ginger um people ask me yeah can i say ginger and then i'm like yeah 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 sure yeah i mean you i don't know should you I don't... yeah you know you 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 can if you must kind of thing it's yeah. the sort of term that i hear redheads use between themselves much more freely and easily and uh, I'm uh, I think it's a uh, I think it's it's our word as it were you know mm -hmm. we can use it mm -hmm. the g word yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah and there is also an, an evolution in 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 the in the names cuz cuz you were telling and it's also gendered that uh women like to call the, their hair like auburn yeah or titian yes and then yes. men are gin men are ginger. Yes, 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 right. absolutely yeah. right. Yes, yes. Tish and red. Yes, we should talk about mm. art. Yeah, we should talk about art. <laughs> so where why are we such inspiration for all the painters back uh, in the day? Well, many, many moons ago I worked as an artist's model, as a life model. And again, I found that what artists most enjoyed was not really the red hair. It was the white skin because the light bounces off it. Ooh. 
so that might have something to do with it. I think it's also because red draws the eye. So if you put red in your in a painting as an artist, then people are going to look at it. Mm -hmm. um, I think artists also enjoy the challenge of depicting red hair because there can, you know, there are so many other colours going on in it. Um, mm -hmm. And I think then again, it's because of this association, particularly of redheaded women and sexiness. If you want to depict a um, a sexy woman, you're probably going to make her a redhead. There are a number of um, cultural, um, again, stereotypes for this. Lilith, Adam's first wife, who was going to have, you know, sort of no truck at all with this business of being, you know, sort of Adam's help meet and servant and, you know, doing the washing and the yeah, yeah, yeah. who went off into the howling wastes of the Babylonian desert, apparently, and, you know, lived her own life out there. Mm -hmm. She is always represented as a, as a redhead. Because she's rebellious. Yeah, she's rebellious. Exactly. Yeah. Mary Magdalene is represented as being a redhead as well. And I can see that there might very well be an association between red hair and prostitution, because if you're a, a sex worker, you want to stand out. And one of the easiest dyes there has been throughout history for red for hair is henna, and that will turn your hair red. So it might be that um, prostitutes have always used henna to dye their hair red and to make themselves stand out and to catch the eye. And that's the association. To customers. Is, yeah, it's yeah. connected. Then you've also got, you know, sort of coming up to the present day, you've got Rita Hayworth, who wasn't mm -hmm. naturally a redhead at all, but, you know, such a beautiful woman. I mean, an absolutely tragic life, but um, you know, a, an, mm. an icon. Even before her, there was Clara Bow, who was um, a natural redhead and was celebrated as the it girl and was in a, um, a, a, a very, stunner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She was in a very She's daring a... film in the 1930s, a redheaded woman. And um, Eleanor Glynn, who wrote very, very racy novels in the 1920s and 1930s, was also a redhead and really, really used her image as a redhead to... Um, to popularize and push her books and her own reputation as a racy writer. She's actually a really a pretty good writer, in fact. And what's a racy writer exactly? Yeah, uh, racy, someone who writes um, racy books, you know, sexy books. Um, okay, okay, she, okay. And um, all of her heroines were redheaded and uh, were okay. come off the page as being absolutely irresistible, even if they, even if they didn't know it themselves. Yep. Very interestingly, I have to just mention this because at the time when Rita Hayworth was at her peak, as a redheaded movie star, there was another movie star coming up through the um, the, the, the you know, sort of the works in Hollywood, as it were, called Marilyn Monroe, uh -huh. who was naturally redheaded. She was a strawberry blonde, as you can see in the early photographs taken of her. But because Rita Hayworth was already there as the Hollywood redhead, they dyed Marilyn Monroe's hair blonde. You know, the blonde icon. Crazy. Yeah, you don't associate red hair with Marilyn Monroe. No, not at all. Not at all. But yeah. there are a sequence of photographs of her when she was a very, very young woman. Um, and you can see clearly that she's got the, you know, sort of strawberry, very, very, you know, sort of curly, ringlety, strawberry blonde hair. And interestingly, she had a very, very rackety childhood, the poor thing. And mm -hmm. um, the woman who was actually her mother, Marilyn only knew um, as the lady with red hair. So, she, you know, obviously came she got through it from her, her mother's mother. side and her father must have been a redhead as well. Yeah. Wow. I think, yeah, I read, you only have like two sentences about Merlin. Yeah, I know. I wish I had yeah. been able to talk about as more because she's such an yeah. iconic blonde. I still get people contacting me now to say, you've got this wrong. Marilyn Monroe was never a redhead. And you just send them one of these early photographs and I say, you know, there you go. Proof. And um, the the red light district because I wanted they don't want yeah. to intervene, yeah. but it also has to do with the red uh, that sells 
Yes. Dark yes, color red that sells. Yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, it's to do, I think, not only with the fact that, um, you know, maybe maybe sex workers were dyeing their hair red to stand out, but the fact that we respond so strongly to red as a color. So you put out a red light and it was going to attract attention much more quickly than, say, a blue one or a green one was going to. There's also many children's characters uh, that are redheads, like yeah. Pippi Longstocking. Yeah. Um, yeah. Jesse from Toy Story. Yeah. Do you think do you think that they're doing a good job at creating a narrative around ginger kids from a young age? I think they are. Yes. Yes, I think the um I mean yes, there have been some negative portrayals of red-headed children as well. You know, there's you know the South red-headed Park. bully. Oh, South yeah. Park just annoys me so much because the misinterpretation of what they were trying to do there. And you know as mm-hmm. I say in the book, you know, the moral of this story is don't so don't show sophisticated satires on the stupidity of racism to the stupid because they are uh-huh, not yeah. going to understand them. I mean, the idea of taking Kicker Ginger Day literally, how absolutely idiotic is that for crying I know, out loud? I know. But, you know, there's there yeah. also been, you know, these, um, I think, redheaded little girls in particular. There's Pippi Longstocking. There's Madeline, who was an absolute favourite of mine. There's um, a freckle-faced strawberry who um, the actress Julianne Moore created in her children's books. And Annie. Annie, yes, exactly, exactly. Anne of Green Gables as well. Um, it, 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 I think it, you know, again, it's a shame that there aren't, other than Tintin, there are, I can't think of any redheaded little boys, but... Um, there, 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 there's Ron Weasley... Oh, of course, is, yes. Now there is, yeah. isn't there? Ron Weasley. Thank you, J.K. Rowling. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But he was he was a bit of a of a dork. Yeah. Um, but yeah. his brothers were really cool, and yeah. they were ginger. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also the yesterday my friend showed me the red hot the red oh, hundred hot Thomas Knight's yeah. red hot calendar. Yeah. Oh, I know. How yeah. much do we love that man? <laughs> yes, yes. He, yeah, he's a friend of mine. And um, he has made it his mission single-handedly to rebrand the ginger male. He was a redhead when he was a so little good. boy and his hair got darker as he got older. But um, he is uh, he ha- is produced these calendars of these just devastatingly gorgeous looking young men yeah, um, yeah, yeah. who are uh, you know there they are all of them redheads and uh, he's he's done you know, such uh, he's in a way he's created his own ethos around this of these devastatingly good looking redheaded young men mm. it's a bit sexualizing It's sex. Well. It is definitely sexualizing. Yes, indeed, and you know, one can have mixed feelings about that. But then, at the same time, one of the um, I remember his very very first exhibition. One of the models he photographed said that he had he dyed his hair. This young man had dyed his hair for years, and he said he found it easier to come out as gay than he did to come out as mm-hmm. being a redhead, which is just so ridiculous Can't believe and that. says wow. so much about attitudes towards you know anyone who's a who's a a, a, a bit different i mean it's just absolutely ludicrous for crying out loud uh-huh. but how can you not come out as ginger when you're ginger Well, you you know you, you dye your hair, you dye your pubic hair, uh, you dye your armpit hair, yeah. you dye everything and you shave your chest wow a lot of maintenance A lot That's of so much work. Yes, yes. Well, but you know, maybe you know, maybe there wasn't much. Um, you know, I don't think I think that there still is not as much demand for redheaded male models as there was for redheaded mm-hmm. as there has always been for redheaded female models or actors mm-hmm. actresses. Um, but the demand is certainly growing, and Thomas Knights can put his hand up and said, "I made a lot of this happen." For sure. For sure. <laughs> Do you? Do you think it will ever um, change or do you think it's just human nature to discriminate what's different? I think it is human nature. I don't think that's ever going to change. But I think what will change is the, I hope what will change 
is not our reaction, but the qualities that we ascribe to our reaction. What I want to change, I don't mind not being normalized. I don't mind only being one of the 2%. That's fine with me. But I want that difference and difference for everybody to be celebrated, to be regarded as one of the things that is wonderful about being human. Not that there mm -hmm. is some kind of norm that we all have to conform to, whether we like it or not. And anybody who doesn't should be ostracized and regarded with suspicion and um, you know, sort of have the worst aspects of discrimination visited upon them. That's what I want to change. And raise your children to, not to bully Yeah, exactly. As well. Exactly. My next non-fiction project, when I when I have finished with this his, the historical fiction trilogy I'm working on at the moment, is going to be a history of baldness, a cultural history of baldness, because again, it's this thing where the, there are all of these fascinating cultural associations around it, and yet once again, it's a characteristic that people have no control over whatsoever. You know, mm -hmm. either you're going to go bald or you are not going to go bald. And it's one where, once again, attitudes are changing, you know. A, f a fear of many, many men. Yeah, yeah. But of, of course, it also men. affects women. And then there is this yeah. extra nuance of people losing their hair as a result of chemotherapy, where the baldness uh -huh. becomes a you know, sort of a badge of heroism, really. So and my partner has um, very, very little hair left. Yeah. And yeah. uh, it was uh, listening to him talk about um, losing his hair, how he felt about it made me think, you know, actually, there's a very, very interesting story to be told here. And I, it's a, it is a very positive story as well, because, again, it's a story of changing attitudes, moving from negative to positive. Uh -huh. So that's going to be the next one. It'll be called Noble Domes. <laughs> cool. Exciting. I will keep an eye on that. And has he red hair? No, no. His uh, okay. interestingly, red hair is in his family, though. His his family is um, Italian American, and the Italian part of it came from Sicily, which was visited by the Vikings. So you do get a lot of redheads in Sicily and in southern Italy, may, many more than you would expect. But um, I, you know, I've always known him, you know, with a with close cropped shaved head, really, and I think the shape of his skull is absolutely gorgeous. But, uh, you know, then uh -huh. you're, you're always your bias towards the people that you're in love with. And uh, he, he I, I don't think he had ever um, had a redhead in his life before. And uh, he's a big fan of redheads. Now. <laughs> That's so good. There was one guy at the festival and he was not he was not a redhead. He was a brunette. And he asked, uh, I asked him, why are, what brings you here? And he was like, redheads. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Oh. You get that. Yeah, man, yeah, the thing for redheads. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yes. That won't disappear either. No, not... <laughs> no, no, no. This is, you know, if you're different, you're always going to be fetishized by somebody. Do you have any advice for um, gingers growing up? Be proud just to of deal it. with be proud of it celebrate it celebrate it as part of the you know the wonderful panoply of human variety it doesn't mean that we're better than anybody else for goodness sake of course it doesn't but it you know it does mean that there are things about us that are that are special and unique and celebrate them and celebrate all the things about everybody else that is special and unique as well we aren't all the same we shouldn't be how boring true there was this saying and it was like um red is fire and fire means no it's not that way it's i forgot what it was but it was saying that red is not boring and that life yeah would be boring without it so celebrate yeah, exactly. it yeah so, exactly yeah exactly mm. it would be well thank yes. you my pleasure my pleasure for writing your book first oh, and foremost thank you go get the book about redheads if you want to know who we are. <laughs> <laughs> thanks for listening to our podcast as well. Uh, thanks for tuning in, Jackie. And um, I'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>